So just a couple housekeeping uh, notes for everyone. At the bottom of your screen, if you hover your mouse, you'll see a chat function. Please, if you have any questions for Dr. McClelland as we go through the presentation, um, feel free to submit questions using that chat function. We've reserved 10 or to 15 minutes at the end of the presentation to answer those questions for you. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, Dr. McClelland, as most of you probably recognize, know um, he's a urologist at Urology Austin in multiple locations throughout the greater Austin area. Um, Dr. McClelland, he's a well-renowned urologist. He's been recognized as a super doctor by Texas Monthly Magazine. Um, on a personal note, he lives in Austin with his wife and three children, and he treats patients in all aspects of general urology, but specializes in urological oncology um, and types of cancers, as well as BPH, which, which is what we'll be talking about today. Um, and another thing to note is Dr. McClelland is a center of excellence for the resume procedure. He's one of only five physicians in Texas who have earned that designation. So with that, I will hand it over to you, Dr. McClelland. Great, well, thank you. And uh, I appreciate everybody taking some time to, uh, to be with us on these Zoom calls. Um, Julie and I were talking earlier, it certainly is a, uh, a uh, strange time where we're having Zoom calls rather than uh, having presentations about these uh, type of events or with these type of events. But regardless, I'd like to thank Julie and Boston Scientific for setting all of this up for us. There is a lot of work that goes into these and putting the slides together and uh, certainly appreciate uh, all of that. Um, let me introduce myself a little bit more and kind of talk about why I'm sitting here talking to you about minimally invasive BPH therapies. Um, I started practice 17 years ago here in Austin. Uh, I went and did my undergrad work at university or at TCU. I went to medical school at University of Texas at uh, Galveston, and then I did my residency at University of Kansas. While well, at the University of Kansas, we had a chairman who was big into research, and he uh, strongly encouraged uh, in a nice in a nice way. Uh, us to do research and the research studies that I was most interested in and involved in had to do with some of the early minimally invasive therapies. Uh, those therapies ended up being things that worked well for about six months and then uh, didn't. And that kind of, but that spurred my interest in doing minimally invasive BPH therapies long term. Uh, that kind of morphed into lasers, different types of treatments, and so forth. And now uh, what I do the most of is the resume, and we'll talk about that more. Uh, my plan is to go through these slides relatively quickly and um, so that we have plenty of time to sit down and talk about this afterwards. Uh, if you do have questions, then just hit that chat button at the end. Uh, next slide. And the next slide. And so uh, what is the uh, prostate? The prostate's a walnut-sized gland. Uh, it's at the base of the bladder. It surrounds the urethra. It's mainly a reproductive organ in that it uh, provides fluid for um, ejaculation and fertility. Um, as us men get to be in our 20s, our prostate gets to be about the size of that walnut. Uh, once we get in our 40s, then our prostate can grow, and that's what can start to cause problems. Next slide. Um, what can happen to the prostate? Uh, prostate can enlarge in a benign fashion, in a non-cancerous fashion. Um, people can have, and that's called BPH or benign prostatic hyperplasia. You can get a prostate infection, which is completely different than this, but can have similar symptoms. And you can have prostate cancer. Prostate cancer is not something we're really even talk about here other than differentiating how we tell what's BPH versus what's cancer. Next slide, next slide. So what is BPH? BPH is commonly known as an enlarged prostate. The normal prostate is about 1.5 inches in diameter, or again, like we talked about, uh, about the size of a walnut. Um, the, uh, as the prostate enlarges, you can have what's called bladder outlet obstruction. That enlargement uh, essentially starts to block the urethra as it goes through the prostate, and that leads to lower urinary tract symptoms such as 
urinary frequency, nocturia, nocturia is getting up at night, urgency, incomplete emptying, and so forth. Next slide. And so does BPH mean I have prostate cancer? Absolutely not. BPH is not prostate cancer. BPH does not cause prostate cancer. Prostate cancer usually does not cause BPH either. They are two completely different diagnoses. At the same time, people can have BPH, which is benign enlargement of the prostate and prostate cancer at the same time, especially as we get old, older. Most men, if they live long enough, are going to have prostate cancer. Usually those are clinically insignificant as they get older. Um, but what we're gonna focus on today is the BPH aspect of it. One of the ways, that, or the main ways that we tell the difference is with PSA um, and with rectal exams. If a person's PSA is relatively stable um, and normal, uh, and normal is a, it's a difficult thing to say when it comes to PSA, uh, but in general, we consider a normal PSA to be less than four or a PSA that does not go up by more than 0.75. And again, sometime uh, with another discussion, we can go over PSAs. But in general, um, PSA and BPH are very different entities. You can have both of them at the same time. And it's important that we figure out who has BPH and who has prostate cancer when we're going through these workups. Next slide. Normal versus enlarged prostate. This is another interesting topic. Um, the, as the prostate enlarges, it can cause pressure or blockage of the urethra as it goes through the prostate. Um, as you can see right here, the urethra goes right through the prostate um, and uh, a larger prostate in general is going to more likely cause obstruction of that urethra. I say in general because there are some people who have really small prostates, but the way their prostate has grown, it grows more inward rather than outward, causing more obstruction. And interestingly enough, there are some guys who have really large prostates, but they have almost no uh, symptoms. So prostate size does not always uh, correlate with the degree of obstruction or severity of symptoms. Next slide. So what kind of symptoms are people going to have with this? The symptoms that uh, we see most commonly are frequency, urgency, getting up at night, uh, a sudden urge to get to the bathroom, and sometimes people can't make it uh, in time to get to the bathroom. Frequently, people will say that they, their stream stops and starts, and if all of this gets bad enough, then they can get to the point that they're not emptying their bladder or not able to urinate at all. Next slide. 95% of uh, men with moderate symptoms are unhappy and do not want to spend the rest of their lives with their urinary symptom. Uh, studies show that 49% of men experience sexual problems associated with low or urinary tract symptoms. That does not mean that the prostate getting larger is causing the sexual problems, but as people get older, as their prostates get bigger, they're at a higher risk to also have sexual problems as well. Um, treatment of the prostate for BPH usually is not going to be associated with improvement uh, or worsening of their erectile dysfunction issues either. 51% of men say BPH interferes with uh, normal aspects of their life and BPH not only affects them but also affects the quality of their partner's lives uh, whether that's because they can't take trips, they have to pee all the time, know where a bathroom is, that type of stuff or uh, whether they're waking them up, getting up at, at night, which is a common thing right here. Uh, who can get BPH? Uh, BPH is the most common prostate problem in men greater than 50. It affects 50% of men age 60. Uh, over 14 million men in the United States have lower urinary tract symptoms. It may be increased uh, at, with uh, a higher body mass index, lack of exercise, and obesity. Um, so what do we do to diagnose this? Um, number one, we're always going to do a rectal exam and a PSA that is mainly trying to figure out, uh, number one, or are we dealing with a prostate cancer issue here or are we dealing with a benign prostatic issue here? Um, if the PSA is elevated, if there's prostate nodules, then we're going to need to talk about doing biopsies and going down the prostate cancer route 
but if people are doing okay, okay with those two things, then uh, the next studies that we're going to do are, uh, we're gonna almost always do a post-war urination uh, study. It's a quick ultrasound we do here in the office to see how much urine is left in the bladder after they urinate. And then frequently we're gonna do a peak urinary flow in the form of something called a Eurocuff study. And that's gonna tell me both an amount of obstruction as well as the flow of urine. There are different uh, self-evaluation forms that people can find online. Uh, the one that I think is the best and the one that I use in my office is the uh, IPSS score or the International Prostate Symptom Score. Next slide. Treatment options, next slide. Um, first of all, behavior modification. Usually people are doing this before they even come to see me. If as uh, us men get older, as their prostates get bigger and they start to have decreased stream, getting up at night, going frequently and urgently, then usually what they'll do is they'll start to go to the bathroom before they go somewhere, make sure that they know where bathrooms are, uh, decrease the amount of fluids that they, they drink at certain times of the day. As symptoms get worse, uh, the first line therapies then become BPH medications, which we'll talk here in, in a minute. Uh, if medications don't work, then there's the minimally invasive therapies that I'm going to talk about uh, as well. And then beyond that, as symptoms get worse or if those therapies don't work, uh, then the next options are surgical options. It used to be that it was essentially medications, and if medications didn't work, then we went to surgical options. Now, with the advent of some of these minimally invasive therapies, such as the Resume, the patients have a go-between step so that they don't have to go from medications to surgeries. Um, and it's really been a huge success uh, that we now have this newer technology that makes such a big difference for people. In late 2018, some studies came out and the American Urologic Association uh, essentially said that we should probably be doing more of these minimally invasive therapies sooner to keep people from having to have surgery and to keep people from getting to the point that their uh, symptoms are as bad as they are, as they can get. Next slide. Um, this is a great slide. Uh, I, I love this because I see this almost every single day. There is no dietary supplement that works for BPH. Um, there have been all sorts of different things that, uh, that have been looked at. Salt palmetto is the most common dietary supplement uh, or supplement that people take for BPH. And it's purely because of the fact that uh, if you look online, if you look at all, all of these advertisements, it will say, tell pe people that uh, these work. The bottom line is they don't. Um, there was a great study about six or seven years ago that was a true double blind randomized study from multiple different institutions has been incredibly well done, and it was as simple as you could possibly do between salt palmetto and a sugar tablet. It doesn't get any simpler than that. Interestingly enough, the sugar tablet group did better than the salt palmetto group. So uh, essentially, there are no dietary supplements uh, that, uh, that help with BPH. Next slide. Watchful waiting, that's essentially like we talked about. That's where you don't want to take any medicines. You don't do anything else. You change change some, some habits, drinking, urination, voiding times, that, that type of stuff. And eventually uh, people will, use, will progress to the point that they're, they realize that they need to do something different. Uh, medications, that's usually the next step beyond uh, changing your habits. Uh, the most common medications that we're gonna try for BPH are gonna be alpha blockers. Alpha blockers are drugs such as Flomax, Tamsulosin, Uroxithal, uh, there's multiple different alpha blockers that are out there. Flomax is the one that I like to start with. It has relatively few side effects. It's generic and it works really well. Um, downsides to taking alpha blockers, number one is taking a medication. A lot of times people don't want to take medications. That is a frequent reason why I will do resume procedures because people don't want to take a medication. Second of all, um, it can cause a, a drop in blood pressure. It can cause dizziness, fainting, fatigue, drug interactions. These are all really rare. Flomax and most alpha blockers in general are very well tolerated uh, drugs. Next slide. Five alpha reductase inhibitors. These are drugs that actually shrink the prostate. The problem with five alpha reductase inhibitors is that it only changes urinary symptoms in 50% of people and it takes six months for it to shrink your prostate enough 
to really do any good. Uh, we used to use 5 alpha reductase inhibitors as kind of a second line drug uh, much more often th than I do now. Uh, now, if, uh, if we're talking about going from Flomax to adding a 5 alpha reductase inhibitor, I will frequently start talking to patients about doing minimally invasive uh, procedures such as the resume procedure because of the fact that, like I said, it doesn't always work um, and it does take six months to work. On top of that, you can have erectile dysfunction, decreased sexual uh, drive, um, and retrograde ejaculation in approximately 15% of, of people. The retrograde ejaculation you can get with really any of these drugs. Um, and to be honest with most of the procedures that we do as well. Water vapor therapy, this is the resume uh, therapy, and this is what uh, I have gone to the most. And kind of like I said at the beginning, uh, when Dr. Thrasher uh, strongly encouraged me to uh, get involved in a study, uh, that study that we were doing was with a novel approach to treat DPH, and that was using radio frequency that we put into the prostate to kill cells and open it up. What we found with that was it worked great in those small areas, but it didn't spread out throughout the prostate um, and therefore didn't really help much long term. And there have been multiple other uh, minimally invasive therapies that have come out. We'll talk about a couple of them here in these next slides. Um, the resume, and I'll show this in a, in a video, uh, really has been the best of these minimally invasive therapies that I've ever done. I've uh, tried uh, most of them as they come out and I am always willing to, to use what I think is the best uh, treatment for my patients. And at this point in time, I think the resume is, uh, is the best that I've ever, minimally invasive therapy I've found. In this video, um, you're gonna see the, uh, the prostate, uh, you'll see the, uh, the, the treatment actually happen. Um, and let's see if we can get the video to start. So um, essentially it looks like the video is not going to start on this, but uh, what I tell my patients all the time is that these, there are excellent videos on the procedure itself and how, to, how we actually do the procedure that are on YouTube. I usually do not tell patients to go um, to any site online. Uh, for really anything medical. Dr. Google is not a very good doctor. But in general, uh, the, uh, the, the videos that you're gonna see and the actual watching people actually get the video, get the procedure done on YouTube are fantastic. Uh, I actually thought about doing one of my own videos, but then I found that there's plenty of people who have already done uh, some really good videos. So you can go and literally watch somebody do the procedure and uh, some of these same diagrams, both on Boston Scientific's website as well as YouTube. Next slide. 97% of patients uh, would recommend or resume to their friend. Um, I do not think I've ever done a, uh, a BPH procedure that has that high of a success rate and patient satisfaction rate. Um, next slide. The prosthetic urethral uh, lift, uh, it's also called the Eurolift. Um, this is the procedure I was doing before I was doing the resumes. Uh, I did this a few years ago. I did uh, somewhere around 50-ish of these uh, patients. Um, what I found was that there were some patients that it worked really well on and did appear to be a durable response. But I also found that there were way too many patients that it really didn't work on or just kind of so, pseudo work. Um, and I also found that a lot of my patients needed to still take medications such as their alpha blockers or 5-alpha reductase inhibitors. And a lot of times people are doing these procedures to hopefully get off of medications. With the resume, I find that almost all of my patients are getting off of medications long term. And let me actually go back up two slides to the video slide that, that we couldn't get going. One more slide up, please. There we go. So let me go over the procedure itself a little bit. Um, 
What we do with the procedure is it's a uh, fairly quick procedure. Uh, we will numb up a person's prostate with a probe um, through their rectum uh, to start off, which is usually not as uncomfortable as, as you, you think it's gonna sound. Um, and then after that, then we put a scope through the urethra up into the prostate, and then it injects steam into the prostate. One of the amazing things that happens with steam compared to radio frequency and some other things that we've tried in the past is the steam is able to disperse amongst the cells. Whereas the radio frequency and other heat therapies that we've tried was not able to disperse and go amongst the cells. And so therefore it creates more cell damage and cell death leading to uh, the prostate being more open than with any of the other minimally invasive therapies we've ever done. And that is why I think that's, that's the big difference with this versus anything else that, that we've used. Whether it's these older forms of heat therapy, uh, whether it's the, um, uh, the Urolift, uh, where we're essentially pulling the tissue apart. With the Resume, what, I, what we're actually finding is cell death and it opens things up better. And what I have found is after uh, doing over 125, I think, of these procedures, uh, that my patients are really doing exceptionally well. In the first 100, first 100 cases, um, somewhere around four to six of those patients, it didn't work very well on, and the rest of them had significant improvement with their IPSS scores um, from a procedure that we do here in the office, and only takes a few minutes. After the procedure is done, uh, people go home with a catheter. I usually leave a catheter in over the weekend, and then usually take the catheter out on the following Monday majority of people can urinate well um, on that following Monday. At the same time, um, I always tell people, you're not going to like me for two weeks to a month after this procedure. And that's because of the fact that that inflammatory response from us injecting the steam in there really causes people to have to go more frequently, more urgently, and their symptoms actually get worse before they get better. When they come to see me at a month out from the procedure, that's when they say, hey, I'm about like I was right before I did the procedure. And then I tell them that that's completely normal. And then we will see them back th two months later, so three months after the procedure. And that's when people come in and say, holy cow, I can't believe I'm feeling this much better with this little three minute procedure that you did in your office. So let's go down to the green light laser slide. There we go. Um, and so the green light laser, this is a one of the proce procedures that came out after some of the first minimally invasive therapies where we didn't want to have to go and do the full surgery. Uh, there was a green light laser. There were multiple other lasers as well. Um, I don't do this procedure anymore because there's been something relatively new that about five, six years ago that came out uh, that was uh, a bipolar button uh, that uh, we started using. Next slide, uh, more green light laser. Essentially what that's doing is getting rid of tissue. Next slide. Um, and so transurethral resection of the prostate. This is the gold standard for surgeries. This is the one that we've been doing the longest, but this is what I was alluding to that, uh, that really has changed fairly dramatically over the last six to eight years. Um, with the advent of bipolar technology, which essentially creates less charring, less problems, we can operate in a safer manner. We can do these usually as an outpatient. Uh, sometimes we'll do a transrethral vaporization of the prostate, where we use something called a plasma button that literally vaporizes the tissue, and sometimes we'll actually resect the tissue um, and send that tissue off for pathology. Uh, this is a surgical option. It's an anesthetic. You, you do have to have an anesthetic. Um, and this is mainly used in my practice for guys who have a prostate that's too big to do a resume, um, or if I'm concerned that uh, there may be something else going on, then we'll go ahead and do this rather than doing a resume. Uh, the number of TUVPs and TURPs that I've been doing over the last couple of years has certainly declined uh, with the advent of me doing resumes. Um, and very few of the resume patients that we did in those uh, first 125 have needed to, to go and have a TUVP or a TURP. Next slide, prostatectomy. Prostatectomy in general is thought of as a cancer procedure. In most cases, prostatectomies are for cancer. And um, there are 
benign prostatectomies that we will do, and that's usually called a simple prostatectomy. Uh, frequently, those are going to be done with a robot as well. Uh, but again, that's a surgical procedure. It's a, a, a much more invasive procedure than even the TVP or the PERP. Um, and this is something that is reserved for guys who have massive prostates. Uh, where they're really not a very good candidate for either the TVP, TERP, or Redoom uh, in my practice. Next slide, insurance coverage. Insurance coverage is always fascinating. You never, I never know what to tell people about this. Um, we obviously will uh, check and make sure that, uh, that people's insurance will, will, will cover it and what their co-pays are going to be. Uh, if we think that you're a good candidate for a Zoom, then we'll go over that, or some of the, the billing office people will take care of that. Next slide. In summary, um, treatment options are essentially watchful waiting, first-line therapies, uh, or surgical procedures. Um, and the big difference over the last few years has been the advent of some minimally invasive therapies that actually work really well, and we believe are long-term uh, treatments that will hopefully keep them from having surgical therapies and uh, decrease their reliance on medications. I always want people to get off meds if I can. Uh, with that, I have started uh, doing Resume almost exclusively as, min as my minimally invasive therapy just because of the fact that I think it's better. Um, I have a long history of doing or minimally invasive therapies and being involved in some of the early research for these. Uh, and in, in my opinion, right now, the Resume is the best treatment for that. In the future, there's going to be other procedures that come out. And as those other procedures come out, um, then we will certainly look at those. But for right now, the Resume is a great way for me to do an in-office procedure that will make it so that people can uh, hopefully get off medications, be much better, go a lot less frequently, get up less at night, um, and in general, be happier with their urinary issues. With that, um, I'm going to go ahead and um, turn it back over to Julie for whatever questions everybody may have. I'll switch okay. the camera up here too. Great. We've got a couple rolling in here. Um, let's see. All right. So one question that came up is, after the resume procedure, when can patients expect to return to work or normal um, activity? So that's very variable. Most people will be back at work that following Monday or Tuesday. Usually I do these on Fridays and then I have people uh, use a catheter over the weekend and then people will, will go back to work that next week. And um, some people want to take, take a little bit of time off. Um, just because of the fact that they're going to have some urgency and frequency. But to be honest, most people tell me that that urgency and frequency, although a hassle uh, for those first couple of weeks, a month or so afterwards, um, doesn't keep them from being able to work, doesn't keep them from being able to do their normal daily activities. Uh, I usually do tell people I don't want them to do any real fi vigorous physical activity, heavy lifting, anything like that for a couple of weeks after a procedure. Uh, just because of the fact you will have some blood in your urine, I don't want them to have to worry about uh, going into clot retention or anything like that. But um, otherwise, they can be back at work on that following Monday or Tuesday, assuming we do there on a Friday. Great. All right, we've got a specific question here. Um, I have a history of urethral stricture and have had it repaired by a urethroplasty following several DVIUs what minimally invasive procedure might be safest for someone like me? So that, that would all depend on how the urethroplasty has gone and what, it, what the cystoscopy looks like at that point in time. If the cystoscopy looks okay uh, and there's no more strictures there, then you can have any of those procedures. Uh, I would probably lean towards doing a resume if you're a good candidate for it. And the way I'd figure out if you're a good candidate is obviously going ahead and you know, looking, looking at the prostate, seeing what, what, how big your prostate is, what kind of obstruction you have, uh, but essentially making sure that there's no evidence of any residual stricture. If there was a stricture, then we'd want to, I'd want to talk about the difference between the stricture causing the issues versus true BPH related issues. Great. Um, okay, another, another question here. Um, 
I'm a self cath user. I occasionally cut my prostate during cath insertion, resulting in anxious time getting urine to flow. Would resume help rather than Urolift? Uh, well, so that that would depend on a lot of different factors, and I'd need to sit down and talk to you about that and see why you're doing intermittent catheterization, um, and as well take a look at the uh, prosthetic urethra with a cystoscopy to see kind of what the um, what the anatomy is. Uh, in general, uh, like I said, I think the resume is a superior uh, procedure uh, over the Urolift. I'm probably not su supposed to say that, uh, but uh, uh, in my personal practice, that is not from Boston Scientific. I'm not being paid for this, and so I think I can say those type things. Huh? Uh, but regardless, um, I think that it is a um, I think it's a better procedure than Urolift in general. So if I'm recommending any minimally invasive therapy, uh, I'm usually recommending the resume over the Urolift just because I think it's better. And again, that is my personal um, take, not Boston Scientific's, if they're being lawyers out there. Um, okay, another question here. Does the resume therapy address incontinence issues as well? So it depends on why people are having the incontinence. If the incontinence is an urgency-related incontinence where you can't get to the bathroom in time, uh, then it absolutely may help with that. Um, usually that urge type incontinence is the, it comes from the, lower, the bladder outlet obstruction that we talked about in one of the slides that then leads to uh, the lower urinary tract symptoms of urgency, frequency, urge incontinence, and so forth. And so if it's the urge incontinence because of the obstruction, getting rid of the obstruction will frequently help with that urge incontinence. Now, I will say that sometimes urge incontinence is one of the things that doesn't get uh, as significant improvement as the getting up at night, the force of stream, the intermittency, and so forth. And if that's the case, once we get somebody to empty their bladder better with the resume, then they end up doing, uh, then we can go ahead and put them on different overactive bladder medications uh, than we could when they weren't, if they weren't in being a bladder. Awesome. I've got a question here and I might but butcher the um, pronunciation of these, these terms, but um, a question came in at Southwest Medical Center in Dallas. They are doing prostate arterial embolization performed mm -hmm. by an in interventional radiologist. Can you comment on that? I can. So it, it's not just at, at UT Southwestern. Uh, it's being done uh, multiple places. There's a couple of people here in Austin who are doing them. Uh, Dr. Connie Sue is the person that I'd send people to uh, if they want to talk to an interventional radiologist. She's an excellent urologic interventional radiologist, and uh, uh, we use her for patients who want to hear about that. Um, my personal take on it is that it is a, uh, there, there certainly are studies that show that it helps. Um, there have not been any head-to-head -head studies. One of the problems, and most of the interventional radiologists who, um, who are open about this uh, will admit this, that it's not just a single artery that feeds one side of the prostate or the entire prostate. It, there are multiple arteries. And so the problem with doing that is uh, that if you don't get all of those arteries or the majority of those arteries, then you may not get the shrinkage of the prostate. Uh, that you were expecting. And so uh, if the resume was not out, uh, then I would probably be leaning towards people having uh, more of these. I think uh, even though there hasn't been a head-to-head -head study of my patients, uh, who I haven't had a lot of them get the embolization, just to be clear. Uh, but of my patients who had the embolization, um, I think that the resume probably has a better outcome. Uh, although I have, like I said, I have no study to back that up. Awesome. Um, what procedure would better stop retrograde ejaculation problem, problems? So retrograde ejaculation is something that can happen from any of the medications, uh, especially the alpha blockers. People will frequently get retrograde ejaculation, such as Flomax. Uh, it's a little less common with Uroxicol, um, which is one of the other uh, alpha blockers that's out there, it's a little bit more selective and has a little bit less of the retrograde ejaculation. Of the surgical procedures, any surgical procedure that, that we do is going to increase the chance of retrograde ejaculation. 
Um, if it's retrograde ejaculation that you're talking about, though, it's because of medications. One of the nice things about a resume is if we don't have to treat the bladder neck and especially the median load, uh, then I found that retrograde ejaculation is less common um, with this than it is with other procedures. Uh, retrograde ejaculation is, is fairly um, low in urolifts as well. And uh, so essentially with the two main minimally invasive therapies out there, retrograde ejaculation is really pretty, uh, pretty rare unless we have to do something at the bladder neck. If we have to do something at the bladder neck, then I think that that, uh, that retrograde ejaculation is a little bit more common. Great. Well, that, that covers all of the questions that were submitted via the chat function. Um, if anyone else has one that they want to get in here last minute, I'll, I'll give you another minute. Um, just for everyone's information, this was recorded and it will be available on Urology Austin's YouTube page. Um, so if you want to go back and rewatch or anything, um, you're welcome to. And you'll also get a follow-up email from Urology Austin as well if you'd like to schedule an appointment or a consultation um, with Dr. McClelland or one of the other physicians. So um, with that, I will close out. Dr. McClelland, do you have anything else to add? I just want to thank, thank everybody for being on here. Uh, I want to thank Julie for her time and setting all of this up. Like I said, this is not something that, that happens overnight. And uh, uh, Julie and, and, uh, and Chris have done a fantastic job getting this going for us. Um, so uh, if anybody has any questions, please call us. Uh, come in, sit down, let's talk about it. Every case is different, and uh, we can certainly sit, can, uh, come up with whatever you think is the best plan for you. Great. Well, thank you again, Dr. McClelland. And with that, that concludes our seminar. Have a great right. day. Thank you all. Bye-bye.